Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 50, Early Tragedy and Aeschylus. Up until the Hellenistic period, all of the tragedies that were put on during the Dionysia were exclusive pieces written in honor of Dionysus and performed only once. The result is that once the reiteration of old tragedies became the norm later, the Hellenistic tragedians could only perform the plays that either made such a lasting impression that they were remembered well enough to warrant being repeated, or those that were written down and survived the accidents of time, in addition to the subjective tastes of the Hellenistic librarians, who played a role in what was copied and thus preserved, and what was not and thus lost. So with that being said, we only have a fraction of the plays that were produced by these men, and furthermore, there were other great playwrights who we have nothing from, besides maybe some of the titles of the plays that they performed. So it's important to realize that while there is a reason that we have plays from the playwrights that we have, they were the headliners. There were also many more playwrights performing plays in classical Athens. It was not just these four guys. And I will try to talk about some of the lesser known ones as best as we possibly can. While no texts of drama exist from the 6th century BC, we do know the names of three other competitors besides Thespis, who we mentioned last episode. Those would be Corellus, Pratinus, and Phrenicus. Very little is known of the first two, though. Corellus lived from 546 to 460 BC and exhibited his first play at the age of 22 in 524 BC. He staged 160 plays and won the prize 13 times. During these early years, Corellus competed often with Pratinus. He produced 50 plays, 32 of which were satyr plays which he was said to have introduced. Satyr plays were distinct from tragedy, although they too were based on Greek myths and the general theme of the heavens, fate, and the gods affecting human affairs in the tragedies was also carried through to the satyr plays. They were more ubiquitous with mock drunkenness, brazen sexuality, including phallic props, pranks, sight gags, and general rustic merriment. The amusing nature of the satyr play did not depend so much on the action itself, as was the case in comedy, but rather on the relation of the chorus to that action. Their costumes consisted of the skin of a goat, deer, or panther thrown over a naked body, as well as a hideous mask with bristling hair, all in accordance with the Dionysiac tradition. The dance of the chorus of satyrs was called sakinis, and it consisted of a sensational kind of skipping and jumping around. Satyr plays also were usually half the duration of a tragedy. After its introduction by Pratinus, and it was met with approval by his audiences, it was implemented into the official program of the Dionysia, that being three tragedies and a satyr play, and would see further development during the 5th century BC. Both Corylus and Pratinus competed at the Dionysia with Phrynichus, and later Aeschylus. We have discussed Phrynichus in previous episodes. He was a supposed pupil of Thespis, although some ancient writers regarded him as the real founder of tragedy. It's rare to find ancient sources to agree on anything, to be honest, especially before the classical period. Regardless, Phrynichus gained his first victory in a drama contest in 511 BC. He is said to have introduced female characters on stage, though as we know, they were played by men in masks, as well as dialogues in a more prosaic, iambic trimeter. Although none of his plays have survived, he produced tragedies on themes and subjects later exploited in the Golden Age, such as the Danaids, Phoenician women, and Alcestis. He was also the first poet that we know of to use a historical subject in one of his plays. As we discussed in episode 35, what would become his most famous play, The Capture of Miletus, was performed in 493 BC, and it chronicled the fate of Miletus after it was sacked by the Persians during the Ionian Revolt. According to Herodotus, the play caused such a disturbance amongst the Athenians that the audience bursted into tears and the government fined him a thousand drachmas for reminding them of this misfortunate incident once again. They also decreed that nobody should henceforth ever produce this play or anything like it ever again. In fact, this was the only time we have on record of censorship in Athenian drama. As he put on the play just a year after the actual sack of Miletus, Phrynichus probably was just trying to install anger against the Persians, supporting the idea of preparation for what he thought was an inevitable Athenian-Persian war. 
Aristophanes, later in his comedic play The Wasps, presents Phrynichus as a radical democrat close to Themistocles, who, as we know, was fervently in favor of preparing the ships for the aforementioned war with Persia. Phrynichus, though, was not perturbed. Although his sack of Miletus didn't go as well as he had hoped, he eventually found a historical event which he could portray without any dread of another fine. That Athenian-Persian War did come, and so in 476 BC, he celebrated the Greek defeat of Xerxes at the Battle of Salamis that took place four years earlier. This play, called Phonisi, and so named after the Phoenician women who formed the chorus, is not available to us today but the theme was naturally more successful with the audience than his previous historical adaptation. Themistocles provided the funds as the Karegos, and one of the objectives of the play was to remind the Athenians of his great deeds in defense of the city. Not much is known about Phrynichus' personal life, though. He is said to have died in Sicily, the date of which is unknown, and his son Polyphrasmon was also a playwright. Polyphrasmon won the Dionysia in 471 BC. The title and topic of his play is unknown, though. He also came in third place in 467 BC with a tragic trilogy based on the story of Lycurgus, a mythical king of Thrace who banned Dionysus and his followers, the Maenads, from his kingdom, and as punishment, he was driven mad by Dionysus. The trilogy was called Lycurgeia, though the names of the individual plays are not known, and no fragments have survived. As it just so happened, the winner for the competition that year was Aeschylus, who presented his seven against Thebes. There will be more on that shortly. Another tragic competitor of the early 5th century BC was a man named Chianitis. Little is known about him, but Aristotle says that he introduced the first comedic play in 486 BC. All we know of them is their titles, though, one of which was Persi, or the Persians. The play, though, may have been a funny dig at the customs of the Persians, who the Athenians had just recently defeated at Marathon. The comedy was put on the same year as Phrynichus' Phonisi. Regardless, Chianitis' endeavor must have been a success because from then on, there was a comedic competition at the Dionysia, as we discussed last episode. The only other comedic poet on the historical record for this time period, though, is a man named Magnus. He was a contemporary of Chianitis, and he is recorded as winning the comedic competition at the Dionysia in 472 BC. The first Athenian playwright to whom we can attribute a surviving play is Aeschylus. He lived from 523 to 456 BC and was a nobleman from Eleusis. His family claimed descent from Codrus, the mythical last king of Athens. Pausanias reports that as a youth, he toiled away at a vineyard until one night, the god Dionysus visited him in his sleep and commanded that he stop wasting his talents and turn his attention to the nascent art of tragedy. Naturally, as one should do if they are visited by a god, as soon as he awoke from the dream, the young Aeschylus left the vineyard behind and began to write tragic plays. He was selected for his first performance in 499 BC at the Dionysia when he was only 26 years old. In his early years, he finished runner-up, most often to Phrynichus, who became his chief rival, until finally he was able to break through and win his first victory at the Dionysia in 484 BC. In contrast to Pindar, who celebrated the genealogies and individual deeds of athletic victors, Aeschylus celebrated the liberators of Greece. He was raised on the poems of Homer and was a contemporary of the triumph of Athens over the Persians, and so his tragedies reflect the sort of religious and national fervor of that heroic era. In fact, as we have mentioned before, his entire family was aflame with patriotism and bravery. His brother, Kynagaros, fell heroically at Marathon, clinging onto the Persian ship, and Aminius fought valiantly at Salamis. Aeschylus too fought at Marathon and at Salamis, and perhaps at Plataea. The Persian Wars thus played a large role in shaping his worldview, and as a result, all of his plays illustrate the sort of brave and proud creed of the Greek warrior. Thus, he comes to be the preeminent representative of that pure and brave generation, known as the Marathonomachoi, who only had to use their names to consecrate oaths, as their names were backed by the respect for which they had earned fighting the Persians. Aeschylus's works thus have a strong moral and religious emphasis. 
He wrote on grand and often terrifying subjects in a correspondingly grand manner. His play celebrated the awesome power of the gods, while also exploring the nature of the human condition. He was able to do this without using neither complicated combination of events nor psychological subtleties. Using a simple structure and being inspired by the great epic spirit of Homer, he presents great and violent passions on stage, though no violence was actually performed. The heroes of Aeschylus' plays are driven by their great passions of impetuousness and pride. Aeschylus is said to have described his work as, quote, morsels from the feast of Homer, end quote. Regardless of his humility, he was an innovator of the dramatic genre, and according to Aristotle, he was credited with having exerted many influences on Greek drama that would set the stage for the grand works of the classical period. In the earliest plays of Greek drama, there was only one actor on stage, the protagonist, who interacted only with the chorus. But Aeschylus came up with the brilliant idea of having a second actor, called a deuteragonist, on stage at the same time with the protagonist. Furthermore, in the early tragedies, the dramatic element of a play was still subordinate to the lyric element, which was represented by the chorus and their dances. But Aeschylus decided to lessen the chorus by limiting it to only 12 people and reducing their role by making the dialogue of his two actors the leading and driving part of the play. This innovation made possible real conflict and allowed for greater dramatic variety for the audience. As a result, Aeschylus brought the dialogue and interaction between his characters to the forefront. In terms of music, though, Aeschylus remained tied to the rhythmic and melodic structures developed in the archaic period. Aeschylus also made visual innovations as well. He was the first playwright to use the mechany, a crane-like device used to lift actors into the air, and he made the costumes for his characters more elaborate and dramatic. By having his actors wear platform boots, called cathorni, he made them more visible to the audience. He also is said to have introduced the use of masks, one of the iconic conventions of Greek theater. Throughout the corpus of Aeschylus, by comparing his first tragedies with those of his subsequent years, we can see an evolution style and the enrichment of his dialogue, character development, and theatrical effects. This is due to the competition in which the older Aeschylus had with other playwrights, especially the younger Sophocles, who we will discuss next episode. Sophocles was an innovator himself, as he introduced a third actor, increased plot complexity, and developed more human-like characters with which the audience could identify. While Aeschylus was at least partially receptive to Sophocles' innovations in his later plays, he remained faithful to a very strict morality and a very intensive religious belief. So, for instance, in the plays of Aeschylus, Zeus always held the critical role of ethical thinker and initiator of divine action. Aeschylus, like many other Athenians, was initiated into the Eleusinian Mysteries, a cult of Demeter based in his hometown of Eleusis. There, through certain rites, initiates gained some sort of secret knowledge, likely concerning the afterlife. Firm details of any specificity are sparse, as members were sworn under the penalty of death not to reveal anything about the mysteries to non-initiates. We will discuss the Eleusinian Mysteries in more detail in a future episode. Nevertheless, according to Aristotle, though, Aeschylus was accused of revealing some of the cult secrets on stage during the performance of an unspecified play. Other sources claim that after seeing this, an angry mob tried to kill Aeschylus on the spot by throwing stones at him, but he managed to take refuge at the altar in the orchestra of the Theater of Dionysus, and so they weren't permitted to harm him any longer. He was then put on trial, and at his trial, he pleaded ignorance. Ultimately, he was acquitted as the jury was sympathetic to the military service that he and his brothers had performed on behalf of the Athenian state during the Persian Wars. Aeschylus also traveled to Sicily at some point in the 470s BC upon the invitation of the tyrant Huron in order to compose a play that would be performed in his newly created theater at Syracuse. And so Aeschylus produced the Women of Etna in honor of the city founded by Huron. After the death of his chief rival, Phrenicus, in the late 470s BC, Aeschylus became the yearly favorite in the Dionysia, winning first prize in a total of 13 competitions. 
Four years after Phrynichus had presented his Phoenicae, the Battle of Salamis also played a central event for Aeschylus in his play Persi, or the Persians, which is the oldest surviving play of not only his, but any ones that we have. It is also unique among surviving Greek tragedies in that its subject is not mythical, but it describes a recent historical event. With the Persians, Aeschylus used this opportunity to celebrate the values for which the Athenians fought, those being liberty as opposed to slavery, and responsible democratic government as opposed to capricious autocracy. However, he differs from Phrynichus' account in that thanks to a shift in the point of view, his play is not a triumphant explosion of patriotic enthusiasm, but instead it is a study of a devastating defeat. Nothing in this work stresses the pride of one side or another. The audience simply watches a downfall, which as Aeschylus implies, is the outcome of divine punishment. In doing so, he focuses on the popular Greek theme of hubris by blaming Persia's loss on the pride of its king Xerxes. The Persians opens with the arrival of a messenger in Susa, the Persian capital, bearing news of the catastrophic Persian defeat at Salamis to Xerxes' mother Atossa. Here, Aeschylus offers a vivid description of the battle and its gory outcome. The messenger tells of the Persian defeat, the names of the Persian generals who have been killed, and that Xerxes has escaped and is on his way back. The climax of the messenger's speech is his rendition of the battle cry during the Greek charge, which we discussed in episode 38. Atossa then travels to the tomb of Darius, her husband and Xerxes' father, and asks the chorus, represented by the old men of Susa, to summon his ghost. When Darius's ghost appears, he tells Atossa that the Persian defeat was the result of Xerxes' hubris in building a bridge across the Hellespont, an action which angered the gods. Before departing, the ghost of Darius prophesizes another Persian defeat, which would be at Plataea, and the audience would have already known that. Xerxes finally appears at the end of the play, dressed in torn robes, he still doesn't realize the cause of his defeat, and the play ends with lamentations by both Xerxes and the chorus. The Persians is a fascinating read, and undoubtedly, the audience thought it was a great performance too, because with it, Aeschylus won first prize at the Dionysia in 472 BC. The Choregos was a young Pericles, as he made his entrance onto the public scene. The Persians is believed to be the second and only surviving part of a now otherwise lost trilogy. The first play in the trilogy was called Phineas. It presumably dealt with Jason and the Argonauts' rescue of a Thracian king named Phineas, who was being tortured by the monstrous harpies at the behest of Zeus. The subject of the third play, Glaucus, was a mythical Corinthian king who was devoured by his horses because he angered the goddess Aphrodite, as we mentioned in episode 46. Given Aeschylus' propensity for writing connected trilogies, the theme of divine retribution may be what connects the three plays. The satyr play following the trilogy was Prometheus the Firelighter, which comically portrayed the titan's theft of fire. Several fragments are extant, and according to Plutarch, one of those fragments was a statement by Prometheus warning a satyr who wanted to kiss the fire that if he did, he would, quote, mourn for his beard, end quote. In addition to the Persians, only five other plays of Aeschylus' estimated 90 or so total plays have survived. That number includes both Tragedy and Satyr. The other plays are Seven Against Thebes, The Suppliants, and the trilogy known collectively as the Oresteia, which consists of Agamemnon, the Libation Bearers, and the Eumenides. Fragments of some other plays have survived in quotes, and more continue to be discovered on Egyptian papyri. In addition, there is a long-standing debate regarding his authorship to a seventh tragedy, Prometheus Bound, with some believing that his son, Euphorion, actually wrote it. They argue against it being Aeschylus's, largely on the basis of style. For all intents and purposes, we will say it belongs to Aeschylus here. Regardless, of the estimated 90 total plays of his, we do have the names for titles of 79 of them. Another hallmark of Aeschylus as a playwright was his tendency to present connected trilogies, in which each play served as a chapter in a continuous dramatic narrative. The Oresteia is the only extant example of this type to have survived intact, but there's evidence that he often wrote such trilogies. Based on the evidence of a catalog of his play titles and fragments recorded by later authors, it is assumed that his other three plays, 
excluding the Persians, were also components of connected trilogies, with Seven Against Thebes being the final play in an Oedipus trilogy, the Suppliants being the first play in a Danae trilogy, and Prometheus Bound being the first play in a Prometheus trilogy. Scholars have also taken titles from his lost works, paired them up, and made connections with what other trilogies he would have put on. As we have mentioned, the authorship of Prometheus Desmotes, or Prometheus Bound, is doubted by some scholars, and no date was recorded by ancient commentators for when it was first put on. So scholars have hypothesized a range from somewhere between 480 and 430 BC, with the latter dates only being possible if it was his son, and not Aeschylus, who composed it. Regardless, the conventional authorship, attributed by the Hellenistic scholars of Alexandria, was Aeschylus, so that is what we will stick with here. Prometheus Bound consists almost entirely of speeches, with very little action throughout the play. The reason for the lengthy dialogue is because the protagonist, the titan Prometheus, is bound to a rock as punishment from Zeus for stealing fire from the heavens and providing it to humans. He also taught mankind all of the trades of civilization, such as writing, medicine, mathematics, astronomy, metallurgy, architecture, and agriculture. According to Aeschylus, in doing this, he thwarted Zeus's master plan to obliterate the human race. This punishment is especially galling since Prometheus was instrumental in Zeus's victory in the Titanomachy. The central idea of the play is that any purpose that benefits humanity will ultimately lead to suffering. The play starts with the personified deities, Kratos, or authority, and Bia, or violence, and the smith god Hephaestus, chaining Prometheus to a rock in the Caucasus Mountains at the command of Zeus. Hephaestus, though, expresses reluctance and pity. The chorus of Oceanids and their father, the titan Oceanus, also appear and express sympathy for Prometheus's plight. But Prometheus, who has the gift of foresight, cryptically tells them that Zeus will get his comeuppance because he knows of a potential marriage that would lead to Zeus's downfall. Prometheus is then visited by an Argive princess named Io, who was in the form of a cow. She tells him that after her affair with Zeus was discovered, he had transformed her into a cow, and the jealous Hera, knowing who she really was, sent a gadfly to chase her to the ends of the world, and that's how she ended up at Prometheus's torturous location. Prometheus, though, tells her that Zeus will eventually end her torment. In the land that would later become known as Egypt, she will bear a son named Epaphus. He also reveals that one of her descendants, through Epaphus, 13 generations down the road, will come and free him. Meanwhile, since he is the king of the gods and sees and hears everything, Zeus becomes worried about Prometheus's cryptic message at the beginning of the play. So in the play's final scene, He sends the messenger god Hermes to learn about the prophecy and who he should avoid marrying. But Prometheus refuses to say anything. The play closes with an angered Zeus striking Prometheus with a thunderbolt. Aeschylus' treatment of Zeus, master of Olympus, as an exceedingly violent ruler over his domain is quite striking. It could be some sort of anti-tyranny propaganda, but at the same time, it doesn't mesh well with this personal religious piety which is another reason why some scholars believe that it wasn't actually written by him. Regardless, Prometheus Bound appears to have been the first play in a trilogy called the Promethea. The other two only survive in fragments. In the second play, called Prometheus Unbound, quite poetically, we see Prometheus' prophecy to Io finally coming to fruition. Her descendant, 13 generations later, was none other than Heracles, who ironically enough, was a son of Zeus. Anyways, during one of his twelve labors, he frees Prometheus from his chains and kills the eagle that had been sent daily to eat out his perpetually regenerating liver, perhaps foreshadowing his eventual reconciliation with Prometheus. We learn that Zeus has released the other titans, whom he imprisoned at the conclusion of the Titanomachy. In the trilogy's conclusion, called Prometheus the Firebringer, he finally decides to warn Zeus not to sleep with the sea nymph Thetis because she is fated to give birth to a son greater than the father. Zeus might have been a lusty god, but he knew better than to tempt fate. So not wishing to be overthrown, he marries Thetis off to a mortal named Peleus. The product of that union would be Achilles, the great hero of the Trojan War. Grateful for the warning, the play ends with Zeus finally reconciling with Prometheus. Hepta Epithebas, 
or seven against Thebes, was performed in 467 BC. It once again has the theme of divine interference in human affairs. It also marks the first known appearance in Aeschylus' works of a major theme that would continue throughout the rest of his plays, that of the polis being a key development of human civilization. The Seven Against Thebes is believed to be the third in a connected Oedipus trilogy called the Oedipodia. The first two plays were titled Laius and Oedipus respectively. The concluding satyr play was titled The Sphinx. These other three plays have very few surviving fragments though. Regardless, it tells the tragic story of Oedipus, the king of Thebes, who unknowingly had married and had two sons and two daughters with his own mother. Upon realizing this, he blinded himself and fled the kingdom. We will cover this interesting story in much greater detail next episode with Sophocles' version of the Theban cycle. But Aeschylus' play, Seven Against Thebes, tells the fratricidal struggle for the throne of Thebes waged by the two sons of Oedipus after a shameful realization and voluntary exile. The two sons were Teocles and Polynesus, and each commanded a considerable army of their supporters. At first, in order to avoid bloodshed, the sons had agreed to alternate yearly who sat on the Theban throne. But after the first year, Ateocles refused to step down. It was at this point that the play begins. A messenger reveals that Polynices has raised an army of Argives and has declared war against his brother in order to claim his crown. The chorus of Theban maidens are filled with fear at this news. This play also features little action and instead consists of rich dialogues between the citizens of Thebes and Ateocles regarding the hostile threat at their gates. We learn that seven war leaders are each leading an assault against one of Thebes' seven gates, and there's a lengthy description of each of these seven leaders. Finally, when it is revealed that Polynesus himself is laying siege to the seventh and final gate, Ateocles resolves to fight against him. After a quarrel ode, a messenger then enters and announces that the two brothers had killed each other in a single combat duel. Their bodies are brought on stage, and the chorus of Theban maidens begin to mourn their deaths. This is where Aeschylus' play ends. However, the ending would be rewritten about 50 years after his death, due to the popularity of Sophocles' play Antigone, in order to bridge the two plays together. In the rewrite, the two sisters, Antigone and Ismene, mourn their dead brothers. When a messenger enters, announcing an edict that while Ateocles will be buried with honors, Polynesus' corpse would remain unburied, meaning that it would be at the mercy of any wandering dogs who might wish to tear at it. This rewritten play ends on a cliffhanger, with Antigone verbally declaring her intention to defy this edict. The conclusion of the story will also be covered next episode. And now, let us take a short break for a word about our sponsors. The History of Ancient Greece is sponsored by the CLNS Media Network, and today's episode is brought to you by Casper. If you're not familiar with Casper, they are a sleep brand that not only has engineered the perfect mattress, but they have revolutionized the mattress industry by selling it directly to the consumers. The result is that they eliminate the cost of dealing with resellers and showrooms and pass those savings directly to you, the consumer. With over 20,000 reviews and an average of 4.8 stars, Casper is quickly becoming the internet's favorite mattress. Casper's award-winning sleep surface is designed, developed, and assembled in-house in the United States and is delivered in a small, how-did-they-do-that, sized box. Their mattresses combine supportive memory foams to create an award-winning sleep surface with just the right sink and just the right bounce. Plus, its breathable design sleeps cool to help you regulate your temperature throughout the night. In addition to the mattress, Casper also offers an adaptive pillow and soft, breathable sheets. Buying a Casper mattress is completely risk-free. Casper offers free delivery and free returns to anywhere in the United States and Canada with a 100-night home trial. If you don't love it, they'll pick it up and refund you everything. This is because Casper understands the importance of test driving before you commit, especially since you will spend a third of your life on your next mattress purchase. So why not make it a Casper mattress? When you are finished listening to this episode, you can visit www.casper.com backslash antiquity. And by using the promo code antiquity, you can get the special offer for listeners of the History of Ancient Greece podcast of $50 towards any mattress purchase. Once again, that's www.casper.com backslash antiquity with a promo code of antiquity. 
That's A-N-T-I-Q-U-I-T-Y. And now, let us turn our attention back to the ancient Greeks. Aeschylus continued his emphasis on the polis with Hecatides, or the suppliants, in 463 BC, paying tribute to the democratic undercurrents that ran through Athens, which would culminate two years later with the reforms of Iphialtes. In the play, the Danaids, the fifty daughters of Danaeus, form the chorus and serve as the protagonist. They flee a forced marriage to their fifty Egyptian cousins. When Danaeus and his daughters reach Argos, they turn for protection to its current king, Pelasgus, but he refuses to agree to help them until the people of Argos weigh in on the decision, a distinctly democratic move on the part of the king. The people ultimately decide that the Danaids deserve protection and are allowed within the city's walls. Almost immediately thereafter, an Egyptian herald arrives with the news that he's been sent to bring the Danaids back to their cousins in order to be married. Pelasgus, though, threatens the herald and urges the Danaids to remain within the walls of the city, as ordained by the people of Argos. This is where the play ends. Because of the suppliant's cliffhanger ending, the Danae trilogy is assumed to have also consisted of Aeschylus' lost plays, called the Egyptians and the Danaids, respectively. Based upon what we know about this myth from other sources, scholars have estimated a plausible reconstruction for the trilogy's last two plays. In the Egyptians, the Argive Egyptian War that was threatened in the first play has transpired, during which Pelasgus has been killed. As a result, the Argive people choose Danaeus to become the new ruler of Argos. He negotiates a peace settlement, a condition of which is that his 50 daughters will finally marry the 50 sons of his brother, Aegyptus. However, Danaeus secretly informs his daughters of an oracle, predicting that he would be killed by one of his future sons-in-law. He therefore orders his daughters to murder their future husbands on their wedding night, and all of his daughters agree to this plan. This is where the Egyptians probably end it, and the Danaids probably opened the day after their wedding, when it is revealed that only 49 of the Danaids killed their husbands as ordered, because Hypernestra was fond of her new husband, Lynchius, and so she spared his life and helped him to escape. Angered by his daughter's disobedience, Danaeus orders her imprisonment and possibly her execution, but Lynchius reveals himself to Danaeus and kills him, thus fulfilling the oracle. He and Hypernestra then establish a ruling dynasty in Argos. The other 49 Danaids are absolved of their murderous crime and married off to unspecified Argive men. In some versions of the legend, though, the 49 Danaids were punished in the underworld by being forced to carry water in a jug to fill up a bathtub and thereby wash off their sins. But the bath would never be filled because the jug has holes so that the water continuously leaked out. This punishment is reminiscent of the ritual where a girl fills up a bathtub and bathes before her wedding night. And so the Danaids, for what they have done, are forever stuck in that moment right before their wedding night. The satyr play following this trilogy was titled A Mimone, which comically portrayed a Poseidon's seduction of one of the Danaids. The only complete trilogy of Greek plays by any playwright that has survived is Aeschylus's The Oresteia, produced in 458 BC, although the satyr play that originally followed it, Proteus, is lost, except for one fragmented line. The trilogy consists of Agamemnon, the Libation Bearers, and the Eumenides. Together, these plays tell the bloody story of the House of Atreus, the royal family of Mycenae, and concentrate on man's position in the cosmos in relation to the gods, divine law, and divine punishment. The trilogy also makes contrast between revenge and justice, as well as the transition from personal vendetta to organized litigation. However, the historical significance of this drama is a point of contention. Some scholars believe that the influence behind the Oresteia for Aeschylus was Ephialtes' curtailment of the powers of the Areopagite Council just three years prior, because the trilogy culminates in precisely the only sort of trial that remained within the council's purview, that being a murder trial. They argue that Aeschylus supported the reforms and chose this drama in order to convince the people that the trying of homicide cases, the one privilege with which Iphialtes had conspicuously not tampered, was in fact the original purpose of this venerable litigious body. In this way, he could draw attention away from the significant limitations that Ephialtes had placed on its jurisdiction by suggesting that the Areopagus was instituted as a court, not as a council, with its true purpose being to pass a judgment on homicides. The play thus might be a calculated attempt 
to reassure conservative Athenians, who regarded the attack upon the Areopagus as impious. Furthermore, the new alliance of the Athenians and Argives, in the wake of Cimon's ostracism, might also be reflected in the trilogy, which portrays the murder of Agamemnon and the vengeance of Orestes. The playwright poignantly plays upon the alliance, and perhaps it is an intended tribute to their new ally, that he calls Agamemnon, the lord of Argos, and not of recently destroyed Mycenae. The whole story of the trilogy also has a moralizing texture. We are never supposed to forget the image of Helen, whose actions caused horrendous things to happen. At one point in the first play, Agamemnon speaks about Helen, saying, quote, When she first came to the city of Troy, Call it a dream of calm and the dying wind, the loveliness and luxury of much gold, the melting shafts of the eye's glances, the blossom that breaks the heart with longing. But she turned in mid-step of her course to make bitter the consummation, whirling on Priam's people to blight with her touch and nearness. Zeus hospitable sent her, a vengeance to make brides weep. End quote. Essentially, Aeschylus is saying through Agamemnon, that Helen set in motion all of the things that worked to bring down the royal house of Mycenae. Because for the sake of bringing her back, Agamemnon killed his own daughter, and for committing this heinous action, disastrous things would fall upon all involved. Thus Helen's beauty brings about death and destruction. The first play, aptly named Agamemnon, is viewed from the perspective of the townspeople as the chorus, and his wife Clytemnestra. It begins with a watchman looking over the sea, He has been waiting every night for ten years for the signal fires, which would notify him that the war has ended. He describes the mood of the city as dark, because this whole time Clytemnestra has been waiting at home, brooding and clinging on to much anger for her husband ever since he sacrificed their daughter Iphigenia to appease the gods and to stop a storm from hindering the Greek fleet before they sailed off to Troy. Also, this whole time she has been having an affair with Aegisthus, Agamemnon's cousin. The story goes that the two brothers, Atreus and Thyestes, hated each other. Atreus had two sons, Agamemnon and Menelaus, and Thyestes had Aegisthus and two other sons. At one point, Atreus cut up Thyestes' other two sons and fed them to him. He ate some of it until he recognized parts of his sons. As a result, he cursed his brother and his family, and the two houses have been divided ever since. So Aegisthus was more than willing to screw his own cousin's wife. For more detail about this family, check out episode 46. Turning our attention back to the play, though, the watchman notices that Clytemnestra seems to be plotting something. At about that time, a signal fire flashes far off in the distance, confirming a Greek victory and the soon return of Agamemnon back to Argos. The watchman announces it as if it's good news, but internally, he knows that something bad is about to happen in the city. But before we continue, it should be noted that the story of Agamemnon is a story about moral confusion. There is no solid right or wrong action, and the audience is forced to think about what they would do in each character's situation. The characters are basing their actions on the oldest system of justice in the world, that being the law of retaliation, which can be summed up simply as an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. It's an unwritten code of justice, represented by the old titan divinities, the Furies. And so everyone in this story believes that they are acting in accordance to the principles of DK, the goddess of justice, from the old generation of the Titans that would sometimes use the Furies to retaliate or cause other people to retaliate to injustice. And so returning to our story, Agamemnon has no trouble getting home, and when his ships pull up to the docks outside of Argos, he climbs onto a chariot that takes him up to enter the citadel. A herald greets him and praises the king, saying that he has dug Troy into the ground with the, quote, pickaxe of the dikey bearing Zeus, end quote. Then, the chariot pulls up to the city walls. Clytemnestra knows that DK would lead him to come home safely so that he can meet justice from her when he does get home. Before he enters the city, Agamemnon stops and says that he must pay respect to Argos and the gods for the just penalty that he has inflicted upon the unjust Trojans. So as we can see, everyone thinks that they are acting accordingly. Both sides have positives and negatives, though. Agamemnon won a great victory, but he did so at the cost of thousands of men, all for the sake of bringing one woman home. When the Greeks sacked Troy, they also committed sacrilege, with Ajax raping Priam's daughter, the seeress Cassandra, on the altar of Athena, and other Greek heroes slaughtering Trojans inside the temples. And so Agamemnon didn't maintain a good control of his army. 
Also, Agamemnon sacrificed his own daughter in order to fight this war, which is why Clytemestra is so angry. But she deepens this moral confusion herself with the actions that she's about to take. Her anger was fueled further because Agamemnon brings back Cassandra as a concubine. So we must ask ourselves, what's wrong with this system of justice? Is it insufficient? Do they need to get rid of the old principles from the Titans in exchange for the civilized thinking of the Olympian gods? The Smith really gives us a clue as to the new ideas of the classical Greeks, who thought that the idea of individualized revenge was an old principle of justice. There's a passage that the chorus sings, saying, quote, Zeus, who laid it down that man must in sorrow learn, and through pain to wisdom find his way, when deep slumber falls, remembered wrongs chafe the bruised heart with fresh pangs, and no welcome wisdom meets within. From the gods who sit in grandeur, grace comes somehow violent. End quote. A popular motif in Greek myth was that wisdom comes through suffering. In essence, the gods make us smarter through violence. Eventually, With the harsh reality and demand of perfection through suffering, man gains wisdom and grace. And this is an evolution in justice that we see developing during the trilogy. Upon his arrival, Clytemnestra conceals her anger and welcomes Agamemnon home with expressions of respect and love, as befits the victor in war. She has her servants roll out a tapestry in front of his chariot for him to walk on as he entered the city. This tapestry was taken out of a temple of the gods and was thus sacred, meaning that only gods could tread upon it. Agamemnon knows this, though, and so he tries to say no, but she flatters him by saying that only a god could take down Troy, and since he defeated the Trojans, he therefore must be a god, and since he is a god, he can walk upon the sacred tapestry. Upon hearing this reasoning, Agamemnon became convinced, and so he walks on the carpet into the palace. Everyone else on stage then follows him, except for Cassandra who lingers behind, and in a prophetic frenzy, she foretells of the murder of Agamemnon and of herself to the chorus of the assembled townsfolk, who are naturally horrified. She then enters the palace, knowing that she cannot avoid her fate. Inside the palace, a cry is heard, as Agamemnon has been stabbed in the bathtub with what Clytemnestra calls her manslain axe. A second cry is also heard, and when the doors are finally flung open by the members of the chorus, Clytemnestra is seen standing over the dead bodies of Agamemnon and Cassandra. She then describes the murder in detail to the chorus, showing no signs of remorse or regret. Then Aegisthus bursts out of the palace to take his place next to her and says, quote, O day that brought justice, now I know the gods exist. End quote. The two lovers then re enter the palace with the doors closing behind them. Because she did not want her young son Orestes interfering with her plans, She had sent him into exile. She also barred her other daughter, Electra, from marriage when she reached the appropriate age, so that there wasn't another man to interfere with her plans. The ending of the play includes a prediction of the return of Orestes, the son of Agamemnon, who will seek to avenge his father's death. The Koephoroi, or the Libation Bearers, tells the story of the retaliation for Agamemnon's death. Around 13 years have passed, and Clytemnestra and Aegisthus have been living together nervously in the palace. Clytemnestra has been having a reoccurring nightmare, in which she gives birth to a snake that turns around and bites her on the breast, which is recounted to us by the chorus. This leads her to order her daughter, Electra, with servants out to the tomb of Agamemnon to pour libations on it, with the hopes of making amends to Agamemnon's spirit so that he would stop sending her bad dreams. Electra hates her mother, though, for killing her father, and she weeps on his tomb instead. Orestes then arrives back from exile, along with his friend, Pylades. He was being goaded by the Furies and Apollo, as it was his responsibility now to exact revenge for the death of his father. He sees his sister Electra crying on their father's tomb. She immediately recognizes her brother, because he was wearing something that she had made for him. They reconcile with each other and lament over the death of their father. Agamemnon's murder poses an agonizing dilemma for the two siblings, though, because they are faced with a choice between killing their own mother and allowing their father's death to go unavenged. But they became influenced by the chorus, who were the libation bearers, and so they whip themselves into a frenzy over their hatred for their mother, and the two of them plan revenge upon Clytemnestra and Aegisthus. Orestes then heads to the palace, and upon arriving at its door, he is greeted by his mother Clytemnestra. He pretends to be a stranger, though, 
bringing the news of his own death, and not recognizing her own son after all of these years, she is thrilled to hear the news, because she believed that she was now safe since her son wouldn't be able to harm her. She sends servants to summon Aegisthus so that he might hear the good news as well. When he arrives, Orestes meets with him privately in a room. With Clytemnestra in the other room, he pulls out his sword and begins to hack away at Aegisthus, who starts to scream out for help. When Clytemnestra cries out, asking him what's wrong, he cryptically yells, quote, The dead are killing the living. End quote. Realizing what's going on, she turns to her servant and says, quote, Bring me my manslaying axe. End quote. Orestes and Pelides then burst into the room and corner her. She tries to talk her son out of killing her, and in an act of desperation, she rips off her dress and utters, quote, These are the breasts that suckled you as a baby. Can you stab them now? End quote. At this, Orestes hesitates, because although he was angry at her and saddened by his father's death, he didn't actually want to kill his own mother, although Justice and Apollo demand it, which is different from the murder that Clytemnestra committed, because she had been brooding and planning his murder for ten years. Pelides, though, who has one line in the entire play, at this moment says, quote, Remember, Apollo told you to do it. End quote. So Orestes snaps out of it and stabs his sword into his mother's breast. Consequently, there is now another murder, and somebody has to take revenge for this one, too. Since there is no one left to exact vengeance, the Furies must take matters into their own hands. The play ends with Orestes running off into the night, screaming as the Furies are chasing after him. The third and final play of the Oresteia trilogy, called the Eumenides, or the Kindly Ones, addresses the question of Orestes' guilt, and in doing so, illustrates the development of social order and a proper judicial system in Athenian society. In this play, the Furies drive Orestes out of Argos and into the wilderness. The Furies are hideous creatures. They have dog-like muzzles, these huge fangs, with blood and flesh hanging off of them, bloodshot eyes, snaky hair and wings. Orestes barely manages to evade them as he makes his way to the temple of Apollo at Delphi, where the Furies fall exhausted on the steps of the temple. They are just about to give up when the ghost of Clytemnestra appears and goads them to continue on. Upon the altar, Orestes throws himself at the mercy of Apollo and begs him to drive the Furies away. He says that Apollo had encouraged him to kill Clytemnestra, and so the god also bears some of the guilt for the murder. The Furies, though, are a more ancient race of the gods, and so Apollo tells him that he can't help, and that he needs the wisdom of Athena. So Apollo sends Orestes to the temple of Athena in the Acropolis of Athens, with Hermes as a guide. When he leaves Delphi, the Furies are free to pursue after him again. They eventually track him down at Athens, and after he pleads to Athena for help, she steps in and declares that the Furies are not permitted to harm him, and that a trial is necessary to determine Orestes' guilt. And so Athena sets up the first murder trial on the rocky hill of Ares, henceforth to be known as the Areopagus. The judges are made up of a group of 12 Athenian citizens, and are supervised by none other than Athena herself. Thus, the first trial by jury was established, in which Orestes' own peers would judge his crime, weigh the facts, and determine whether he was guilty, or had a reasonable cause to do what he did. The Furies argue their case first, saying that theirs is the oldest law in the universe, and it can't be overturned, because justice is simple vengeance, and that if the Athenians overturn it, the Furies will be forced to destroy Athens. Orestes then argues his case. He pleads that it was Apollo who told him to kill, and he speaks of an analogy about planning in his defense by saying, quote, I am being charged with killing one of my parents, while I submit to you that a mother is not truly a parent, just the father. The father plows the field and plants the seed, while the mother is just an incubator to keep the seed safe. So killing my mother is not killing one of my parents, end quote. After Orestes finished pleading his case, the twelve jurors vote. Since they deliver a tie vote of six each, Athena has to step in and break the deadlock. Having heard Orestes' proclamation that it is the male and not the female who is the true parent, and bearing in mind her own birth, fully developed from the head of her father Zeus, she decides that the claims of the father trump those of the mother, justifying Orestes' murder of his own mother in revenge for his father. Orestes' acquittal, though, predictively does not sit well with the Furies, who prepare to attack the city as they had threatened, but Athena steps in once again. She ultimately persuades them to accept her decision, and instead of violently retaliating against wrongdoers, as they have been, they henceforth will become a constructive force of vigilance in Athens. 
She argues that extenuating and mitigating circumstances can override or slightly alter the law of retaliation. Justice is not simple vengeance, but rational analyzation. And harsh justice is tempered by mercy and understanding. She renames the Furies to the Eumenides, meaning the kindly ones, and says that a shrine will be built to honor them in the center of Athens. They accept their new positive role, but throw out a warning, saying that the simple concept of vengeance is not going to go away. If this modified type of justice swings too far and lets people off the hook, meaning justice is not rational, they will return to destroy the city. That's the warning in the myth, that the basis of law, the foundation of justice, is still an eye for an eye. It has only been modified. Athena then rules that all trials must henceforth be settled in court, rather than being carried out personally. Plainly, Aeschylus conceives the creation of responsible government in Athens as the antithesis not only of tyranny, see Prometheus bound, but also of a disordered chaotic universe in which emotional and female forces of vengeance were paramount. The new world will be governed by orderly, rational institutions, planned and staffed by men, with vengeance replaced by justice. Following this performance of the Oresteia at the city Dionysia in 458 BC, Aeschylus left Athens and returned to Sicily for the last time, visiting the city of Gela, where he would die two years later in 456 BC. The Roman author Valerius Maximus wrote that he was killed outside the city by an unusual circumstance. Supposedly, an eagle, carrying a tortoise in its claws, dropped it onto his head because the eagle had mistaken his head for a rock that was suitable for shattering the shell of the tortoise so that it could eat the reptile. Pliny adds, ironically, that Aeschylus had been staying outdoors as much as possible in order to avoid a prophecy that he would be killed by a falling object. The inscription on his gravestone makes no mention of his theatrical renown, though. Instead, as you might expect, it focuses on his dedication to his polis as a citizen soldier. It reads, quote, Beneath this stone lies Aeschylus, son of Euphorion, the Athenian, who perished in the wheat-bearing land of Gela. Of his noble prowess, the grove of Marathon can speak, and the long-haired Persian knows it well. End quote. Despite his preference to be known as a pious defender of Athenian freedom, Aeschylus's work was so respected by the Athenians that after his death, they paid homage to the greatness of his work by decreeing that the eponymous Archon would grant a chorus to any playwright who wanted to reproduce one of his plays, and his plays were the only tragedies allowed to be restaged in subsequent competitions. Aeschylus's popularity is evident in the praise that the later comic playwright Aristophanes gives him in The Frogs, produced a half-century after Aeschylus's death. Appearing as a character in the play, Aeschylus claims that his Seven Against Thebes, quote, made everyone watching it to love being warlike, end quote. And with his Persians, Aeschylus claims that he, quote, taught the Athenians to desire always to defeat their enemies, end quote. Aeschylus goes on to say that his plays inspired the Athenians to be brave and virtuous. Modern scholars and theater critics also hold him in very high acclaim. His sons Euphorion and Euaeon, and his nephew Philocles, also became playwrights. The genre established by Aeschylus would become one of the defining art forms of Greek civilization. Tragic drama, as it evolved throughout Aeschylus' career and in the hands of his successors, Sophocles and Euripides, was in many ways the hallmark of Athenian greatness. Through Shakespeare and other great tragedians of Western civilization, this remarkable testament to the heroic struggle against human limitations forms an important part of a legacy that has endured to our time. On the next episode, we continue our journey through the evolution of Greek tragedy. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 51, Sophocles. Mm-hmm.